Lawrence, thanks for coming on. It's it's been good to catch up for the last last ten minutes. Uh, but I'm so thankful for you f- jumping on. Yeah, pleasure. Ple- yeah, nice to see you again. I was. Um, do you know what I didn't know since we? Uh, I mean, you recently sent me over the copy of the book, uh, but I didn't know your your middle name. Your middle name is. It's a new middle name. Well, right. since I got married. Yeah. Okay. How do you pronounce it? Kasu. Right. It's almost feels it's like m- it's got some deep heritage. Well, it's it's a very old Danish name, so it's my wife's surname, and that's how we right. The agreement we came to was we would take my name as the surname, but we would both have her. her we would keep her surname in as our middle names. Yeah, that's actually um, they do that a lot in I know Spain. Spain system they do like the the daughters get the mother's surname first and the father mm-hmm. the sons of the father get their surname so wow that's a, a nice little agreement that you've got to that you got to yeah uh, how, how well, I mean it? I am I am kind of half Danish now Danish, yeah. <laughs> in the Danish family so it makes sense that I, my name long, reflects that as well how long have you been there I've been in in Denmark for eight years now wow and have you mm. have you found the like, what's the sport culture like in in Denmark? I mean, the what the Euros is going on right now, and and obviously what happened to Ericsson on the field has been a big thing, and and uh, the game they won for one the other night was an incredible, incredible game. But um, yeah. what's the culture? What's the sporting culture like in in Denmark? It's a it's really interesting. It's a really strong part of Danish culture, but it's in a very specific way. So they're, they're very proud of it because it's a it's a club based culture so there's actually very little kind of support at the elite at the elite end but they get they punch above their weight because they have a really strong kind of community club culture that takes athletes almost all the way to the top and some there's not so much in the way of school sports university sports doesn't really exist but these clubs are they, these central hubs of communities so kids will will be signed up to one or more clubs often football or handball but obviously like, i see the fencing clubs and yeah. uh and they they really they're run by volunteers and often volunteer coaches as well but some are professional and then they they're just really they're, they're really well supported by the community so they they just they can take their kids and the athletes really far so it's a fascinating kind of it's been fascinating seeing this system and how it com- compares to the british do you think there's anything that they do better than the British system. I, I, my being in like club sports in the UK, I feel there is, and it's really hard to change, but I feel like there's just an oversaturation of clubs and that can dilute the, the talent pool. Sometimes it's a balance because you want to have max participation. But for example, in again, sport that I play cricket, our system is built with many, many clubs uh, with all a pathway where those clubs can move up and down leagues. But the difference between what I've played here in the UK to p- compared to what I played in Australia is that I played in a district competition which sits below the professional level and all community clubs feed the district teams. So it's a, it's its standalone league and it sits alone in, in almost like a performance. It's still club culture, but it is a, a performance pathway to the top. But here in the UK, if you're in the top league and you you lose, the you come last in the year at the end of the season you go down a league and then a new team comes in but the i find the problem with that is that you never get and players move around players start to move around clubs and then you never really get a strong system of of high performers at that pointy end with a huge crop of people sort of filling it from the bottom works mm. it seems to have worked in australia and it seems to be a good system and they're even trying to like my my um, state that I was playing in South Australia, they're trying to even reduce the teams because they want bigger quality. Whereas here, I always feel like it's new clubs cropping up, and that then spreads spreads the the amount of people playing and, and the, the high performance. Is there anything that you see? I think it's mainly like Scandinavian. My perception of Scandinavian countries is that they they have a strong structure and clever structure that's slightly different to to other nations. Is that is that about right? Yeah, it's quite it's quite unique to Scandinavia, to Denmark, which is this kind of community base. I mean, they're very collectivist as a culture here, so everything is done kind of as a welfare system. So you, 
there's no, there's very low barriers, financial barriers to being an athlete, for example. But mm. so a couple of the things they do really well is that the clubs are so strong, the athletes stay in the clubs and very few sports have central kind of elite training centers where an athlete gets good enough and then they leave their club to the central. They, they, yeah. they will stay in their clubs training and also train with the national squad. So that's one thing. And then another really important part is kind of natural to the system here is that they, athletes almost always study all the way through their careers. So university education is free. In fact, you get paid to study here um, wow. all the way through to master's PhD level. You get a salary from the government. So it makes it, I mean, it's a really, it's a really good path for an athlete to take is to, to, to be, uh, to, to study a, a degree because you get some salary there and you can pretty much live on that as an athlete and, and studying. So there's, wow. there's a balance, there's a balance in life for, for, for athletes that they're not just the athlete. Very rarely are they professional athletes. Yeah. Wow. Won't stay on Danish, uh, Danish uh, structure, sporting structure for much longer. But, um, what was you, did you study when you were, were growing up and did you find that, um, did you find a balance of, of, of any work and study life? I, I, I did a bachelor's degree in social psychology, but I couldn't say I was balanced because I actually, I, the first year I, I competed and studied, it was my final junior year. So I, I did that just about managed it, but then I stopped, I took a break from my comp- competitive career to, to do my last two years of university and really focus on that. Um, so it wasn't really balanced. And then I came back to, to the sport after I graduated. So I'm very glad I did it. Um, yeah. I definitely don't regret it. It was a wonderful, wonderful time in life, but I didn't do it side by side for very long. But let's actually rewind a little bit. You, so you grew up in a family that already had Olympians in it. So your, your parents were Olympians. Um, mm. was it, did you feel it was just a natural thing for you to, to get into um fencing or was it was it a part talk us through just what it was like growing up um how you got introduced to it obviously through your parents but and is there was there a moment for you that you felt was a a time where you like right this is actually something that i really really want to do or was it just a natural well that pressure? time came much later actually because there was no real opportunity to be a fencer a full-time fencer in the uk until after until i was in my 20s but it was a uh, yeah. My parents had there were obviously easy opportunities to get into fencing. My ran my 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 ran my my mum ran a kids club on Saturday afternoons, so I took part in that. I did all other sports as well. My family were just very sporty, so all, my older brother and sister didn't really take up fencing. So they we were all doing tons of sport, um, and I didn't. I enjoyed fencing. It was a it was a focus for me, but it wasn't the only thing. I played a lot of rugby, a lot of football, just all sorts of other things. So that kind of continued and I was I was also at one point in my kind of late teens I was considering whether I should go down the rugby or or fencing route um went for fencing because I was I was kind of high ranked in the country then um but still there was never a case of like this is what I'm going to do I'm going to be an Olympian and I'm I'm going to make this my job because it wasn't I wasn't at that level yet I was still a junior level and it was a long way to get to to top to Olympic level and we didn't have, yeah, we didn't have kind of professional fences in the country at the time. Mm. And that first became poss- a possibility when we won the bid for the London Olympics. So that was 2006, seven. And that was, maybe we won it a little bit earlier, but I graduated in 2006. And, and then there was an opportunity. They were, they were funding all, all Olympic sports. And as part of that, there were, there was some, Olymp- some, some funding for professional fencing kind of fences and that was just a, a hugely lucky kind of moment in my life I graduated didn't have anything else I wanted to do oh, then offering professional fences great I'll do that yeah so <laughs> so that was an easy decision from from the outside looking in I think people might assume or yeah make an assumption that because your parents were in the sport that you may be pushed down that route or pressured into doing that was that the case no i don't no i never felt that they were they they gave me all the support i wanted they really they loved the fact that i was fencing so they 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 made the, the path as easy as possible for me to choose it let's, yeah. say, let's put it like that um took me to competition and took me to training and 
so there was if I wanted to do it there was never any any hindrance there but yeah I didn't I didn't feel any pressure to and like I said when I was deciding whether to do other sports or I decided to to stop my competitive career to to go to university or to focus on uni there was never any any pressure otherwise um, so I think I, w- I was lucky in that sense that they I mean there there was some I had to ban my dad from coming to competitions with me because he <laughs> he just couldn't he couldn't hide the emotion that he had like the nerves and like he knew too much about the sport and yeah so I, I told him he couldn't come so that like there were there were kind of dynamic aspects to it that that came from that but but no I, I always felt like I was in control of of what I wanted to do did you like them watching you? Did you enjoy them having them there, or did you prefer them not being there? Because I like—I no, think of when I when I played, like I I didn't actually mind it whether they were there or not. Sometimes I didn't even know they were there. But yeah, did you? Well, enjoy like that? I said, I banned my dad from coming. Didn't like yeah. him being there. My mum couldn't watch me; she was too nervous anyway. But actually, I, as soon as it was, as soon as I was like fourteen, I think and could start traveling with my coach and my teammates, then they, they were nowhere there. Like, I, I was just like, okay, I'm, it was an amazing opportunity to go away and go to competitions without your parents. So that was it. That was the last, the last time they would kind of travel with me or watch me because it was, it was just too cool. It was too cool an experience to be free of your parents and going and doing this stuff. So, yeah. And, um, and what, um, when you came out of, of you finish your studies fencing came an option to to do professionally was it was it driven by the goal to get to london to do the home games was that the the out and out goal yeah suddenly i mean then it was it was immediately kind of that was the goal because we had quota places every sport had in every british team had quota places for the olympics so we knew that we would have a team in the olympics Mm -hmm. then i mean that changes everything then it's just a case of being in the national team and you and you qualify and by that stage i was i was definitely going to be one of the favorites and i backed myself to to get back up to standard pretty quickly which which i did um it wasn't a smooth route it was a bit of a roller coaster but yeah then it was from 2006 to 2012 was just all eyes on the olympics yeah and just for a little bit of insight into fencing when you say team like how big's the team um, and there's again, forgive me if my my, my fencing knowledge is m- minimal, but there's different types of, of fencing. Yeah, there's three three different weapons: foil, yeah. epée, and saber. I did foil. They each have their different weapons, physical weapons, but they also have different rules kind of attached to them. Um, so there's a national team in each weapon. There's competitions completely separate. You don't you don't do more than one discipline at a time. Um, and there's four four people in a team, so you you fence in an individual to- tournament, as you kind of would imagine about fencing. But there's also team fencing, where it's actually three people in a team plus a reserve, and it's three versus three, kind of alternate alternating fights, so nine fights in in mm-hmm. one match. So that's the, that's the team event, and for an Olympics, you can qualify as a team. So that's what what we were going for. So I I needed to be in the top three or four to go to the Olympics in London. Yeah. Did you enjoy? Again, that's a it's a there are some sports in the Olympics where it's like that, where you have the individual performances that make up a team performance. Did you, did you really enjoy the team aspect, or were you uh, someone who enjoyed the individual side of it? Yeah, I loved, I loved being in a team. I mean, I was, uh, yeah, I played rugby and football my whole life and loved that aspect of it. So the, I really, I, I st- even missed the kind of the true team element of playing rugby from fencing. So I really, I did thrive on on that there was a team that you could be there together so it was, but similarly I, there's a there's a lot of joy to be had in the individual side of things as well so mm. I enjoyed both and leading up to the Olympics obviously you've got this goal of of getting into London there's probably a range of emotions that you're feeling both excitement nerves and and, and I think that last couple of days the Olympic squads in in Team GB have just picked up their their kits and the teams are being finalized for Tokyo so there's obviously everyone be feeling that. What what sort of emotions would would sort of those athletes be expecting to feel? Did you feel when you were leading up to really in the last sort of bit towards the Olympics? What was talk us through what that was like? Well, to to talk about that, I have to go. I have to wind back to to the beginning of the Olympic year actually, because I 
I'd been, I was a short fire for this team. I was kind of number two in the country and we were, we were looking pretty good. I was, I was at the peak of my career so far. Then in January, the first training competition of the year, training event of the year, I, I fell over in training and broke my wrist, broke my sword, sword arm wrist. Wow. And that kind of sent after five, six years of total focus on the Olympics, it became Olympic year. It was literally like January the 2nd of Olympic year. And I got my first injury, proper injury in my life. And I was, I was just, it just sent me into a, a really dark place. So that was the first half of my, of my Olympic year was really dark and quite depressive. I had two surgeries on my wrist, four months without being able to train any kind of any, fen- any technical fencing training, just some physical training and not knowing whether I'd be getting back, whether I'd be able to use my arm at, at all that year or let alone kind of get back to Olympic level fencing. So it was a massive roller coaster from there. Um, and yeah, just, I, I just about, I got back just into shape for the last kind of world cup tournament in May, I think it was in Korea did okay. And then, and then it was Olympic selection and, in and i got i got selected but as number four is the reserve for the team event not in my kind of in the top three so i wouldn't fence in the individual so there was this whole other thing of kind of being resentful and bitter and jealous of my teammates and wow had to kind of struggle through that and know that i still needed they still might need me for the team event so i needed to be a a good team a supported team member and not just drag the team down with my bitterness um so it was all of that wrapped up in this like preparation for the london game is my hometown i'm from london mm. so it was just a massive yeah, massive massive roller coaster it was it ended up being an incredible experience and like yeah the kit collection was this whole day you got like bust up to nottingham like this huge area where you got like a personal shopper that like you got to try on every piece of kit and they'd note it down and then like just a crazy experience like unbelievable and then everything building up all just everything in your hometown is about the olympics it just very like very few athletes go to an olympics and even fewer get to experience a hometown olympics and mm-hmm. that that it really is i mean whatever level of athlete you are if you get that is something completely unique like we'd be We'd be traveling on the underground in our in our GB suits, and people would just be streaming up to us, thanking us. Like they had no idea who we were, like, yeah. what we'd done, just like thanking us for for being there, for creating this experience. It's just just crazy. Got got free uh, offer of free meals at Gordon Ramsay restaurants during the Olympics, so we just pop out and wow, uh, turn up to to get our table in, in the center of there. Yeah. So so cool. It was such a cool experience. I did go, get to go and watch some of some of the events. I got to go watch basketball, USA play, and like that was nice. It's just walking around like the games makers. They were unreal, and we did it. We did it really well. Like we did actually do mm. that Olympics really really well. And then obviously things like Super Saturday just kicked it off and into this mm. huge thing that it was. And the opening and closing ceremonies were amazing. And just from the outside, it was incredible. But being on the inside, I it just, like you say, it probably doesn't get much better than that as an athlete. Um, yeah. But I, something you just said there, I think, is really interesting um, emotion that athletes, I 100% know, feel, but probably don't talk about, and that's jealousy. Mm. I think that jealousy of when people are doing well or people are in a position that you would either like to be in and perhaps feel like that, that like you said, resentment or maybe a, a sense of unjust that you're not there. Um, I think I think that's an emotion that athletes definitely go through, but probably don't acknowledge. Um, and I even think just thinking about it, I don't. I I think it's okay to feel that, but I think if you probably wallow in it for too long, then it can become. A, a painful place to be in and a, a destructive place. Resentment is a is an awful, awful emotion. It's there's a, mm. a wonderful quote by Nelson Mandela that resentment is like drinking poison and hoping it will kill your enemy. 
Yeah, yeah. And it really, it is, it is truly destructive. Like if you wallow in it, I think, as you say, it's natural that emotions come up. And I was in a, in a really dark place and the resentment was, I saw these guys who I knew I was better than just kind of hop above me. And I thought, you you don't deserve this. I deserve this kind of thing. And I, it stuck with me for too long, but luckily I had a fantastic sports psychologist that I worked closely with for that period. And she helped me kind of work through that so that it didn't, it didn't linger too long. And, and especially that I could get to kind of the games preparation time in a far better, more positive mindset. But I think athletes could be, yeah, you're right. That it's far more prevalent than we would like to admit or people would like to admit. And we mm. could really do with a bit more awareness or understanding of how to to deal with it and actually in in researching for my for my book there's a there's a chapter a section on gratitude and there's a researcher from australia actually called kerry howells who presents gratitude as the antidote for for resentment and it's, it's a fascinating kind of area it's very very new there's there's only a few researchers in gratitude in sport context um but it can really it's something like that like there, there are actual tools that we can teach people and athletes for like, if you feel like this, then you can, you can use this tool, this gratitude, this thing called gratitude to, to kind of as an antidote. Yeah. There's a lot we can do. I think that that for me, the way you've explained that seems to be the only, the only way I could possibly see that, that feeling of jealousy and resentment. And and I feel it is, it's it, exacerbated in the world we live in because of social media whether it's like brand deals that that again the high-end athletes are getting or even if you're at like a club level um and an amateur level there's still sort of some sort of public recognition that deep down people are craving because we're taught or we're being shown all the time through social media through any sort of media that this is the this is the thing to to enjoy to to get and it puts you on a, a pedestal and you you crave that and it takes you away from knowing where you've come from or where you've been and what you've you've looked at rather than or, or what you've achieved and and looking at someone else and like you said almost trying to to be in their shoes when you can't like you you have to be you have to walk the path you've been on and then make that choice either to sit in that that resent that resentment or to move past it and and do something about it which gratitude i can only think of it being one of the 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 main ways of of getting past it just being grateful for for the opportunities you've had where you've come from the the work you've put in and it and it doesn't mean that stops because someone else has achieved something it means that you can choose to continue working um yeah that's i definitely would like to to check out that that study and mm. see see how far that goes yeah yeah it's a, she carrie house presents gratitude as the opposite of resentment actually mm. so that's it's it's fascinating because we don't i think too many of these concepts like resentment like vulnerability we we just don't understand them particularly well so they they mm. they just bubble up inside of us and then they just take us where wherever they 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 want and we have no tools we have no real understanding of how to work how, what works against them my the version that what i did with with us like my psychologist was kind of working on a values-based approach so what my values were and how i would want to be as a as an athlete as a teammate and and kind of holding that up as a mirror to myself and obviously mm. you don't want to be holding a grudge against the guys that you're going to be going to the olympics with you want to enjoy it and be there for them so that was that was one route but but this is just another one, this gratitude kind of work. There's, there's exercises you can do. It's really, it can be really tangible as well. Yeah, and, and we're probably not taught as a, as a young athlete or as a young person what it looks like and, how, and, and having role models that will, um, will actually physically show that practice of being vulnerable. Being, and, and there's way more people coming out now doing it, and, and that's the brilliant mm. thing. Um, and obviously the brilliant thing about something like social media is you do get to see it. You get to see mm. it on it. So it can be as much as it's given touted a force for bad, it can be a force for good used in the right way. And that for sure is allowing people to see how to be vulnerable, how to show gratitude. Cause ultimately you just need that, 
that how to guide you need you okay yeah here's gratitude I, i've got this word but what do i what do i do with it how do i practice it what does it look like and vulnerability okay i understand what the word may mean but what is it actually physically the action look like of being vulnerable is it me showing something is it me saying something is it and what are those words what does it sound like and that's um that's the for me is the the practice the actual physical action of what to what to do mm. and just on the last the last word about resentment is that we have this kind of the structure of sport is that people get selected and people don't get selected and it's just a constant force for resentment is those who are not being chosen mm. it's just in every team in every level all every weekend right up to olympic level and that was the the grudge that kind of that was the, the catalyst for my resentment was not being selected for this place that i thought i deserved but it's just it's built into the system that athletes will experience kind of being sidelined when they mm. think they, obviously they feel like they should they should be in the team and and so we really it's not just a kind of every now and then something will happen it's built into the system yeah. we need this kind of thing to to help alleviate that those yeah. feelings when it happens because it will come up time and time again if it happens once it may happen or maybe you missed maybe you've uh you say dodged the bullet but you've maybe get selected doesn't mean you're not going to get deselected in the future or moved and transferred around so that that could actually change very 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 quickly was there a shift that you made between london and rio was there a shift that you've was there a big shift or yeah what was the difference in yourself between those two games yeah, massive. I mean, like night and day almost, but precipitated by the fact that I took another two years off from competitive sport. I, right. Because of that Olympic year was being was so stressful, I decided to take a year off to start with. I was just like, I, I didn't know if I would come back to it or not. I just knew I needed to go away and book myself a year traveling around the world, doing some things that I've been wanting to do for so long. Um, and then part of that year was spending a couple of months in in Copenhagen in Denmark where I mm. met my now wife and actually never came home again I finished my year of traveling booked my flights straight back to Copenhagen and had never moved home so that year became two years of of a break and then in 2014 I kind of I, I saw my team doing well and we had a shot for for the Rio Olympics but but there was a, there was still a space for me I thought yeah. So I decided to to come back for to give it a proper shot. Training from Denmark this time, so I didn't come back and train with the elite with the national center. Um, I kind of made some stipulations. I'd set up my life in Denmark. I was I was I was in quite a strong position. I wasn't committed to. I wasn't bought into coming back to fencing. I needed to do it if I could do it in my in my way. Hmm. And I'd done this work with a psychologist, and I had this new kind of frame of mind, which was. I'm not going to do it for in a stressful way. I'm going to do it for the joy of it. I'm going to, yeah. It was all about the kind of, yeah, really wanting to be there, doing the training in the way that I wanted to, that kind of, to keep my motivation high. And so I, I actually kind of reached the highest levels of my, of my fencing, but only doing, for example, only doing fencing training two times a week and then doing a load of physical training, which was kind of the, the opposite of what most fences will, will do in their training. Um, and yeah, it just brought a kind of freedom to my performance and kind of joy and freedom to, to my fencing that allowed me to, to perform a lot better. Mm. And, and we started working with another sports psychologist who kind of helped us with our team kind of dynamic work. And that was also really, really pretty special. Um, I also kind of, I also described that process in the book. Um, so yeah, it was, it was night and day. It was, it was really a it was a totally different me and a totally different kind of life circumstances that I was in for both Olympics. That That's such a common theme, I think, that keeps coming up in these conversations that I've had. And, and funny enough, Frances Horton in, in a previous episode had spoken about how once she released the idea of result and the sort of the outcome and, and just really focused on the enjoyment. And it, this was more for her last games that she had. And, and, and she spoke about how that, enjoyment factor was a and just being again, it's cliche but the best version of herself she then felt at peace in some way shape or form with her sport or and really found that was sort of like the pinnacle of of 
sport really for her and, and competition because it took away that stress of the outcome and being driven by what that looks like and and focusing on yourself really and and if that gets to you to that level great um yeah i think it's important to to note that the way i did it the way francis did it 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 becomes possible when you put in many years of kind of i couldn't have done two times training yeah. a week from when i was 20 years old i needed to do six seven days for, for no, a number of years kind of not grinding it out but just you need to get the hours in I could, yeah. I could do that, that kind of training later on. I was more knowledgeable. I had better understanding. I, I had I built up my technical level. So things become more available like, later on in your career. You're, you're also, you have more perspective at that point naturally yeah. as you mature as an athlete. So you can kind of, it just becomes more, more possible to, to kind of set the results aside a bit. You've achieved some results, so you're not so wrapped up in like, I need to make it. I need to prove myself. But that said, there's a there's still elements and there's still parts of that kind of attitude, that approach that you can you can you can bring to young athletes. Mm. You're not going to turn them into that same kind of relaxed, joyous, free athlete that I and Francis kind of found ourselves in the age of 30, 32. Like that's not that's not realistic. But yeah, you can definitely kind of nudge nudge younger athletes more in that direction of like, hey you'll have a much better time. You'll enjoy it more. You'll actually perform better if you just let go of that result kind of drive yeah. a little bit. Right? So just turning those dials up a little bit for the young athletes is, is still possible. That's such an interesting uh, way of looking at it. And and you're so right. Like that, you need to have that element of I'm driven to get somewhere because going in sport, it has a there is a win loss. There is a goal. And I think you, want, if you want that success, if you, if you do want to have that success, or even be just at the end of it, just the best possible athlete you can be, you have to you have to put in that work. You have to put in the the um, you have to sacrifice so many different things. And yeah, you can't just thinking about it. You can't be going in with this this joyous, happy go lucky uh, view. That's that's so so right. Mm. But then again, you don't. Yeah, you don't want the opposite. You don't want a totally driven, like, results orientated attitude either. That can that can take you. They can take you somewhere, but you burn. You tend to burn out quicker, and you tend to not enjoy what you're doing. And and as kind of the the heart of what my the message in my book is about is that if you're just focused on results, you might achieve it but you it won't mean anything to you by the end you'll finish your career and you'll look back and there was nothing meaningful about it mm. because the results themselves don't hold any meaning it's what you did along the way mm. and the relationships you built up and the experiences you had so if there if there was no awareness and enjoyment and joy around those things if you didn't find meaning in that journey if it was all about the result then there won't be any meaning in that either so i think we can do a far better job of like you don't just let athletes have the attitude. Okay, you're super driven. You're you're all about the results. Fine, take it away, mate. Go and go mm. and bag them. Like that, that we shouldn't be allowing because we know it's we've got all the examples we need in yeah. the world now of people who have done that, achieved it all, and just a, a left bereft, a left kind of depressed and empty. Johnny Wilkinson, classic example. Michael Phelps, like when when you're 20 gold medals feel make you feel empty and worthless mm. like there's something there's something missing along the way yeah that's um that's so true did you feel anything when you when you finished after rio did you did you go through that feeling did you have anything in place that you felt kept you steady i guess or did you feel that experience i so I, again kind of lucky or I, i'd already Coming back from the two-year break, I, I made kind of made a plan to try and qualify for the Olympics for two years, but knowing that was going to be when I'd retire. So I also spent those two years preparing what was coming next. And I actually had a, a part-time job for the last year in a fencing club as a performance director. So I was working part-time already. I knew that was something I was going to continue with. Um, I'd started working with the Triathlete Project already before the Olympics. I decided kind of planning that anyway so i 
I was completely ready. I was I was ready to retire, and I was happy to. I was happy to kind of to put those kind of hang my swords up. Um, mm-hmm. But it takes some preparation, and it takes. I mean, not everyone gets that opportunity. If you get suddenly injured at the peak of your career, you don't you don't necessarily have the opportunity to prepare then, which kind of points to the fact that you need to be always prepared. Mm-hmm. Like anything can happen, so you you can't really allow yourself just to be left with nothing suddenly and in, in an identity crisis. So mm. we'd start, so you can start talking about dual career and kind of having, having your studies alongside. I, I just think it's important to have a rounded identity, to have different parts of yourself mm. all the way through that. You're not just an athlete 100% because that's what's going well, because at some point it won't go so well. Yeah, I, I I almost see it as chapters of a book, really. Like it is, and and people do talk about, oh, I've moved on to my next chapter. But it 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 is understanding that if you're especially going into the high performance end and the, and and you're making a career out of your sport, to recognise that it is a part of you, it's a part of what you do or what your journey will be, and it's okay to give it one hundred and ten percent, but also don't be naive to think that it will last forever and also be prepared for that next bit. I really like the things uh, looking at people like like The Rock, like Dwayne Johnson. Like he is now <clears throat> one of the world's biggest movie stars. But he started as a wrestler and his you may not people will grow up knowing him as this huge movie star but may not have remembered him when he was in WWE. And like that's when I remember him. Like I remember him for watching that stuff. And but it's just a real clear show that he had one career in uh, in the sport or entertainment business, and then now he's in this much bigger, broader sense, and he's he's almost a completely different character. Um, and and people like I guess you could look at Will Smith. So people who have had these multiple different roles and and multiple different identities, depending on who you are, and that for me is something I always look at for athletes. And there are so many different athletes out there that maybe had a career in in an Olympic sport, but now are perhaps politicians. Mm. And that's something that shows there's a part where that career of of what you are growing up and driving yourself to be moves aside and this new birth happens of a a new role and a new life that you get and if you can have one eye on that early on and and recognize it just be aware of it and just be, and and not dwell in that journey that you're you think is the one and only path then when it does end it's just that little bit easier to take it doesn't make it easy. You don't, I, don't, I don't think it's making it like this soft landing. You you will go through it, but you will have at least some sort of tool or some sort of outlook on life to recognize that, okay, it was a journey. It was a part of me and it will forever be a part of me. Um, but this is where I can go to now. And this is and, and staying true to like who you are as a person all along the way. Yeah. And actually, now you say it, I remember distinctly feeling like, it would be such a great thing. I really like love the idea of after I finished my own fencing career to do something so different and achieve something really big mm. in a in a totally different field to the point that people are like at some point find out you were an Olympian as well. Like yeah. just, and then again in something else. And my my friend who you might want to talk to, Kath Bishop, was an Olympic rower. She won she won a silver medal in Athens and uh, together with Catherine Granger then moved on to becoming a conflict zone diplomat for the British Foreign Office and now is in her kind of third kind of third era and is a kind of business and leadership coach. Um, And I just think that's that's what I like. Like you're talking about The Rock and Will Smith, like those those people who are just have just achieved something, have driven themselves in something totally different. I always thought that was the coolest thing. It hasn't happened yet because I carried on living and yeah. working in fencing, but but it's still I still hope to. Yeah, there's that that's exactly where I think I'm at with it now as well. Like I I look at even and it's tough because even though I'm still playing the sport on on the weekends and I'm helping and coaching people and they tend to be around the sport that I play and um, I'm still got this part of me that's like right get ready to just put the bags down and move away from it. You don't don't know when that will be, but maybe that's a part of that journey that eventually there'll be a nice little segue somewhere that will just 
that that's the path we're going on. Um, but uh, I we, we've spoken about you've mentioned the book, and I think it's it's be great to just talk about some of the things that are that are in it. And I know there's um, a section around that I'm really interested in. So becoming a true athlete. Um, obviously, for, we've mentioned it very lightly, but the True Athlete Project, that's actually how I met you. I, it was a mentoring system and a mentoring program for for young athletes. And I was a mentor. You got guys got me on as a mentor. And what was the, I guess, don't know really where to start with this. Let's perhaps talk about the True Athlete Project and the catalyst for it and, and why it exists. Yeah. So the... The True Athlete Project was set up by our CEO and founder, Sam Parfit, in around 2014. And I got involved in 2016, straight after the, the Rio Olympics. Um, he set it up as a kind of, well, the, the mission is to create a more compassionate world through sport and a more compassionate culture of sport. And we do that kind of re-envisaging re the athlete as somebody who trains mind and body for kind of to make a a contribution to to the world and re-envisaging sport as a as a kind of a ground a fertile ground for developing these true athletes so we have a, a range of programs kind of ngb coach development programs um retreats we do mindfulness for athletes classes and and i got involved with the mentoring program very quickly the, when i joined in 2016 they, they were just piloting the first mentoring relationship and I kind of got to come in and and had lots of ideas of how we can put some structure around it and what what I thought that young athletes could could be could could get used benefit in learning early on the kind of the things the pitfalls that I came through and that most athletes do come through that you can help younger athletes avoid sometimes quite simply just by hearing that them hearing the right message from the right person and sometimes with a bit more practice and so that and that program just kind of just grew and grew from there and it was just it became just such a, a joy to be involved in it was a, it's a it was a voluntary job it still is for me so and sam is actually still the only full time the only employee of, of tap at the moment and the rest is just kind of done by by volunteers and yeah that mentoring program grew from one relationship to seven a cohort of seven pairings which you were involved in and then mm -hmm. 17 the next year and our current cohort is 34 pairings and across 33 different sports and 10 countries so it's a mm -hmm. it's a global program just really mixing matching at senior kind of elite mature kind of paralympic olympic athletes with aspiring young athletes and they go through a year-long relationship meeting it's pretty regularly every one to three weeks working on a curriculum that we kind of we've designed with with these kind of themes around performance and mindfulness and identity and values and community responsibility and the, the final theme is nature and connectedness so it's a really holistic program mm. um and from that from the beginning we've kind of talked about it's a really it's a unique Charity, it's a charity. It's a charity in the US, actually, and it's a, currently a non-profit in the UK. And it's a it's an organisation with a really unique vision for sport and and a positive vision on the one side, but kind of recognising where sports failing to live up to that vision, to, to that to its promise, on the other side. Um, so we talked for a, kind of right early on how cool it would be to have some kind of manifesto of like this vision. What is it that we that we stand for and we believe in the power of sport, but what needs to be done? Where where do we see it not living up to it? And what needs to be done? And then that kind of manifesto turned into an idea for this book that I, I started writing just over a year ago. And and that's that's what the book is. It's not it's not quite a manifesto anymore. It's a it's we call it a practical philosophy for for athletes for flourishing through sport. Mm. Um, and it just in, in kind of encompasses everything that we that we think is is missing in the current kind of athlete development. All of these kind of what traditionally terms softer kind of elements, gratitude and self-compassion and vulnerability, which are not soft in any sense. They're, they're the most kind of, the things that really build up the most resilience, the most kind of like, yeah, antidotes to burnout and dropout and abuse. Like it's really a, a total kind of, 
cultural paradigm shift that we're advocating for here. So the book itself is huge, it's kind of hugely idealistic, but in one sense, but it's also got some tools and strategies very on the ground like for athletes like what can you do here and now what kind of training can you do every day to 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 help yourself and to to build this culture of sport yeah i, I think the the biggest thing at the program i got as well was because you don't match athletes to similar athletes in similar sports so you don't put athletes that have come from the same sport sometimes it's completely different like my athlete was a fencer like you put me with jack and he was a fencer and but it was so interesting and you spoke about these these pitfalls and these journeys you go through as an athlete and it's just the same things that they're going through like you you almost assume that oh they must be going through different experiences but once you start having conversations once you start seeing where they they're thriving or struggling they're exactly what you did they're just holding a different piece of equipment they're just in a completely different team but the whole experience around what they're doing is 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 very very similar um and that's what i think the best thing that that program showed was how everyone can learn off everyone everyone mm -hmm. just can learn off and the group sessions and the what both with the mentors talking to each other and then the mentees having their experiences shared that was it allowed people to feel not alone as well, mm. like really not alone in what they're doing. Go, okay, this is okay. This is a part of what I should be experiencing. Um, and that's, again, almost from where this podcast is birthed, like just hearing those experiences because once you hear them and you go, okay, well, someone else is feeling that. Someone else is feeling self-doubt. Someone else has had a, a poor performance and probably doesn't have the, has lost that feeling of worth in where they're at. And um and there's so many different areas you can split off to, but ultimately it's all the same experiences, just a different sport. And for those young athletes to hear a multiple Olympic champion talking about their own struggles and doubts and, and feelings of insecurity or losing confidence. I mean, it's, it completely, it completely humanizes the, those athletes that you tend to see or young kind of, young athletes tend to look up to and think, well, they've just got no troubles. They, they've just got it all together. And then suddenly they're working with a mentor or they hear from somebody that is struggle is struggling or has struggled with all the same things. And it's just hugely important for them to get the real message that it's not these superhuman superhumans that achieve that level. It's hmm. normal people like all of us who just have found their way through and have put in the work and put in the hours and they end up making it. It's not it's yeah. not something magical. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, self-compassion. This was something that I know is a section of your book and something that you have spoken about before and I, it's such an interesting topic in the world of 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 sport. What for you is perhaps the common pitfalls of self-compassion and how do you become a more compassionate athlete? Yeah, so this came about, my kind of interest in the area came out from personal experience that I used to be that kind of athlete who was super harsh on myself, just really, every time I lost or made mistakes, was really beat myself up. And I would feel terrible after after losing in tournaments every time, in tears every time as a kid and even as a young adult. And then as part of this work I did with a psychologist in, in 2012, so mid mid to late 20s she just kind of helped me see that you don't you don't need to feel terrible I thought it was a it was an important part of kind of why I was a good athlete because I felt so bad I would work hard to to improve so it didn't happen again and and she helped me see it showed that showed me that you can you can absolutely give everything to a performance and not feel terrible afterwards and in fact you can just because you're giving everything to the performance is why you don't need to feel terrible you you should feel okay if you've put in your absolute best and and that kind of that led me onto this kind of exploration of like I found it through that work and then realized just how freeing it was so I was I was being motivated by the fear that I would feel if I lost like I so bad i hated losing i was going to feel so bad that i was going to i was going to work hard and i was i was going to be motivated to win the match but that kind of going back to that joy and freedom i felt in performance later on in my career 
that came from a totally different place. Like, there was no fear. If I lost, so be it. But I really wanted to win. I so I wanted to give everything. Mm. And it's kind of part of that part of that journey, part of that, the, that tool set was just forgiving myself for making mistakes. And if I lost, yeah, being kinder to myself for that. Like it was, it's part and parcel of the journey is you're going to lose sometimes. Just focus on what I could have done differently or, or just work on kind of analyzing the result and analyzing the performance and and so i kind of i've always i've always appreciated especially later the kind of more a deeper side of performance what the, kind of finding the deeper connections with sport and with performance and maybe even to a spiritual or philosophical level and self-compassion is a is a really kind of strong part of buddhism and and it I mean, the Dalai Lama, every, everything he says is about being compassionate and self-compassionate. There's real power to be had in, in that. And I think it just, it made so much sense to me to connect that to my own, my own performance. But then watching, seeing young athletes as I've been working with them in the last five years, everyone's doing this. It's so common that athletes mm. are beating themselves up and yeah. suffering and then performing worse because of, because of it. They're distracted, they're frustrated, they're all these kind of secondary effects that come from from treating yourself harshly from mistakes or losing and it's just a it's just so it's almost ingrained in sport culture that that's that's a good thing like an athlete who's really beating themselves up the, the coach is almost looking at them like yeah that's the way son mm. you're gonna you're gonna you've got a real desire to to win the next time but it's so ineffective it's so inefficient far more efficient would be to be more forgiving, kinder, to get over those kind of mistakes quicker, refocus quicker, not bring all that baggage, all that frustration and disappointment with you, just to get back to get your focus back on what do I need to do now? And yeah, so I, I wrote a wrote a series of blo blogs about that for for the True Athlete Project, and and that seems to be the thing. And when I've shown the that section, that those blogs, and that that part of the book to, to athletes that's the thing that really catches them that they all identify with that and say yeah that's something i really recognize and i could i could do with integrating more so it's just so clear to me how ubiquitous it is and how important yeah. it is i think uh we as athletes anywhere we we feel like it's like the rite of passage like i fail i need to beat myself up and it's almost been ingrained in the whether it's still a cultural shift or a societal shift that needs to happen, that it's um, it's almost like, yeah, you failed. You need to go and work yourself to the bone to 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 get out of that place and and recognizing that okay, it's a it's a part of just getting better. Just like getting better is failure, and getting better is 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 a part of that whole process and as quickly it's turning that around as quickly as you can self-compassion is a tool that can allow that um i think ego plays such a big part of it as well like when we've failed the, ki the kids especially young athletes that i've seen who have failed they feel like they need to be seen beating themselves up mm. because that then makes them stronger in some strange way is what I've seen is they or, almost... or it shows it shows everyone else how how dissatisfied they like they were with losing or making that mistake like that's not me yeah. like, everyone else needs to know yes I'm that's right this. yeah but it's fair it, I often see that as well that they're doing it for everyone else to mm. show to show that side of them that but yeah it's 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 so it's so common and 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 so compassion can be used in you can kind of work with over a long time, but it can be, it's a really practical tool as well. It's about your inner dialogue, right? It's about mm. just changing it bit by bit to like in the moment you can, you, you can use self-compassion. It really is. It's not this kind of soft fluffy thing. It's, it's very specific about self-talk and what kind of self-talk you want. So it can be used in the moment and it can be used in the, the hours afterwards. And as you say, it's just about getting your, your, your mind back on, back in the right from the right kind of track as quickly as possible my, my feeling is that the sort of side cart to this whole uh, well belief of self-compassion is self-acceptance and that 
sits alongside it hand in hand is that you accepting where you're at, accepting what is happening to you, whether it is in the moment or over a longer period of time, you're just at ease. And and that once you accept that, once you have had that self-acceptance, then you can start to perhaps whether it's improve or change. But again, if you you if you can't accept it, you're constantly I really like what you said there about I'm doing this to show everyone else that that I that I I'm not happy with this. I'm not I'm I'm this is I'm showing you I care. Um whereas actually just being at ease and accepting, okay, like I got that wrong. I this is a part of maybe I failed here, I succeeded here and that's cool. Let's let's move past it. Let's keep going. And I I I remember distinctly being that that person who who is reacting to show others I'm better than this. You should know you need yeah. to know I'm better than this. And I I just remember it so <laughs> clearly. And I also remember I just just as clearly or even it's more recent is when I completely kind of shed that that armor and was perfectly accepting of the the mistakes and the failures and just how how much more efficient, how much more powerful that yeah. state of mind is. Like mm. it just, it just didn't come with any baggage and I could be right back on and giving and back to my kind of fiercest mindset without that baggage. It was just, again, it's just the night and day of, of how the, the performance mindset that you, that you want. Yeah. Using that kind of self that acceptance, compassion versus not. Yeah, I, that's such a, efficiency is a real big one because I think I've seen even in training sessions where I've set out a task for a, for a player to achieve something, they fail, they don't get it because again the training is designed for them to fail because you need to mm-hmm. fail to to understand where you can get better. But once that failure happens, there is a moment whether it is it could be two minutes, it could be twenty minutes, it could be two hours, where they are still beating themselves up over that failure. And you think whatever time frame we are working with it, you have wasted that time to just let it go and then go again. Like just mm. have another crack. Like we're in training. Like we're not in the competition mode yet. And this is where you can do that. And I think it it you're right. It, it speeds up the process for learning if you can just go cool that happened. Let's go again. Dust myself mm. off. Let's go again. And and just letting that acceptance happen much faster. Obviously, it's a practice that you need to to do and, and mindfulness and meditation can be a part of that practice. Mm. But when it's used in the moment you need it, which is training because you've committed yourself to that time to get better, it be- makes the process so much more efficient. It makes mm. it so much better and so much more like, like it's effective in getting the outcomes you eventually want, which is I want to get from A to B, but all that stuff that's happening in between A to B is all of this, this failure, this this beating yourself up. And if you can get past that, that A to B becomes a little shorter and you get there that little quicker. Yeah, and that that's on a kind of, that's on a pure kind of sport development performance kind of mm. s- spectrum and then if you if you imagine that just kind of spread out over many months and years of all of those time increments just shorten massively so you're, you're suffering far less it it shows a picture of an athlete who's just overall far more enjoying what they're doing over a, over this longer period and they're going to stay in their sport longer i think athletes who don't find this kind of this mindset shift will just be they'll be suffering so many of them suffer just far more than they ever want to put up with and end up burning out or just quitting because it's not it's not worth the suffering Mm. and they don't have to suffer that's the thing like i think it's just that's a huge another huge kind of inefficiency in the system people dropping out way too early way before their potential is reached because it's just too hard It's it's not a nice experience because of this ego, this kind of emotional ego kind of wrapped into the whole thing. And, and it doesn't have to be like that. We could have these athletes far longer, far more enjoying their sport and retiring far happier if they can shorten those periods of, of suffering after mistakes and failures mm-hmm. over the months and years. And then even, as you've mentioned, a part of the triathlete projects, sort of, I guess, outcomes, is that broader perspective on community and, and I'm a real big believer in the True Athlete Project, what it stands for, and, and using things, having having this more mindful approach to being an athlete. Now, I think it, the, 
the tough thing I think some people may have a preconception about is that if you are seen to be having this mindful approach that it means that you're calm and you're almost not working it goes so far the other way against this working hard grind to the bone sort of athlete mentality that's thrown on adverts that you see but what it really means and I think we're almost touching on it here is that once you start to have that self-compassion for yourself that self-acceptance for yourself you transform into this this different person that that interacts with the world differently you doesn't mean you train any less mm. it doesn't mean you don't work as hard it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean as much to you but your interactions with those around you change by by showing self compassion maybe a little bit more patience with yourself that then can inspire someone next to you that can then inspire that network and it grows and grows and that's where you start to impact the community around you um and sport has that incredible power to do that because one, it's almost, it's it's bilingual. It's completely, it's a global language sport and you can mm. see it transform communities both locally and globally. I think the Olympics is going to have this incredible pull on the globe this these coming months because of we've all been in the same boat with the pandemic. Athletes across the world have been in that same boat and that's just a, a a snapshot of sport being a, a global force for good. But if you can think of yourself becoming bigger than yourself in your community, that's one community that changes. Then there's another community that can be inspired by that and change what they do. All through individuals having that little bit more self-compassion, self-acceptance for who they are. And it it will transform the people around you i've been working with some kids from really deprived areas in the local um, county here and these these kids have huge complications in their life we've had kids that have been abused we've we had a kid that was that was stabbed over the summer holidays um the they have structures in their life that are unlike many kids that I've met and, and what I've experienced and I'm sure what you've experienced and the challenges they face are astronomical. However, the one thing that connects them and brings them together or changes the way they look at things is sport. It is mm -hmm. it is the common denominator. Whether they, whether they even like it or not, it is the common thing that can have an impact on how they interact with themselves and the world around them and teaches them so many different trials and tribulations and successes and failures of of life through sport and even by teaching them these kids at the sort of the far end of the spectrum side of it to teach them just a moment of self-compassion through failing to catch a ball failing to hit a ball failing to kick a ball teaching them that element of self-compassion can then change hopefully and we may not see it because i'm not following them for years but hopefully have that impact down the line and a domino effect and mm. that's where i think the true athlete project the work that you guys are doing can change the the, the communities and the sport whatever sport it is or sport in general uh, impact on the world yeah well you're those kids you're working with sport and cricket provides the, the kind of the environment for them but actually then it's the coach that's the true driver of whether it's a positive or a negative kind of mm. outcome impact like you say role modeling or just giving those those moments of compassion or or kind of development or mastery mindset whatever it is it's the coach is so central to and we talk about coaches as social change makers some of the biggest yeah. social change makers in the country and we they really there's some work to be done on, on recognizing the role of the coach a lot more. Um, and that's all that also ties back to mentoring. So my, the reason I was so kind of engaged in the, the, the tap mentoring program was that I, I had an experience mentoring a young kid when I was, when I was training myself, just a, a kind of standard big brother, big brother kind of mentoring program. He was a nine year old kid who's having trouble at school and, and didn't have his dad around. And the, I just noticed, I just saw just the massive, just the incredible impact of being a, 
positive role model just being there hanging out with the guy I wasn't doing a lot of teaching just just hanging out with him and it also affected me hugely gave me a huge amount and that that's just the, the immense power of having having a role model in that mentoring relationship and that that's why I'm so excited about our, our mentoring program as we grow every relationship like that you never know quite where where it's going to go and because ours is like that one I had it's a year long it's really intense like there can be quite a lot of trend like we call it transformational for for both mentor and mentee and it has so many knock-on effects it's it's it really is like this ripple effect for we have our logo is a butterfly so the mm. the butterfly effect that mm. that we hope to come to come from it um yeah it really can lead to to huge huge social change I think this outlook of sport is really important like you said really important for the coaches because that is where if i just think of my own journey the almost the values that i have instilled in my own life um and i know you speak about values in the book and you've spoken about today how you have you you created your core values those core values that i had were built from either the senior players that i was ex- around or the coaches that i had early on and you in consciously or subconsciously are taking in those values and those ways of living that's where if this work and this outlook on sport can be adopted by the coaches early on you can have a they they do have this change maker effect like they they are the the social change because they have such an impact on so many people um and even speaking to a teacher yesterday just through language just through tone of voice just through body language enthusiasm passion all of these different elements but it being able to ooze your own beliefs and your own values in a authentic way they take that on they just ta- they just in get they just children are just sponges they're just engaging with that and they they they're mimicking it um and if your language is slightly off or just is slightly more aggressive or and it, and it's really i find it really tough for coaches to to not revert back to type which is perhaps what they learn and mm. and and experience themselves and it takes a it takes a lot of self awareness to be able and and again probably self acceptance as a coach to go okay i probably recognize this is where how i've been interacting with my players and my athletes i need to change that because this is this is the outcome i want but i'm not I'm not creating an environment for that to happen. So this is where the work not only can be shown to the athlete themselves, but I need to do it myself. Mm. Yeah, we need to consider the coach developmental journey just as much as the athlete developmental journey, for sure, because they have such an impact. Mm. Yeah. Is there... Is there, um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, is there another part of the book that you've... And there's so many different elements of it which i i think are, are so valuable and i'll be leaving links in the show notes for people to to find the book to get the book and and again both from an athlete and i think a coach's point of view um is there anything in the book that you feel has been something that has really is a real resonator with many different sports many different people or a, almost a, a super topic if anything i think we've touched on on the biggest ones I mean, around around values, around compassion and gratitude, and kind of this fear versus love motivation is also a big one. But I think that I mean the the main thing I mentioned it. The main theme of the book is that we we're losing track of this kind of the real meaning and value of sport mm-hmm. itself, and the book presents an, a, a way of getting back getting that back and it's through personal development and growth but also through giving back through developing oneself individually as a, as a coach or as an athlete in order to have a, a more positive impact on the world around you and and many of them almost all the, the eastern originating martial arts have founding philosophies which are very much like that they're all about they were designed specifically to develop individuals to impact their community and we we don't have that in any Western sport, at least not, none that I came across in my research. It's a modern Western sport that has a founding philosophy like that, and it just kind of points to that fact. And the Olympics does in in the Olympic Charter, but it's it's very few Olympic athletes who who know what's really in it or or kind of follow it particularly. Yeah. So 
it's it, we need to get back to something like that like a founding philosophy for sport that that actually is is based on what the meaning is and what the meaning is for the individuals because it's not the winning the, the medals and the winning is not where the meaning and the fulfillment comes from we yeah. know it's somewhere else it's in the journey it's in the growth so we all we all have a kind of responsibility and everyone in the sport especially coaches and leaders to, to create environments that are focused on on the meaningful aspects and valuable aspects and not just how the win loss column yeah and i think the thing i like sort of flicking through the book as well is the the practical practices that actually have to be a part of that um mm. i think it's very very common again probably from a coach's point of view that we say what the outcome should be or what we hope it to be um or even just okay you can you should have a little bit more self-compassion but what is that how do you create that? How do you actually practically practice that? And obviously, mindfulness and meditation is a, a huge part of the the TAP philosophy. Um, obviously, my experience and, and work on it is is the same, and I believe the same thing. So that show this book is showing that there are actual practical ways of being able to to implement all of this. Um, and yeah, the creating your own philosophy your own core values just keep echoing that that is that is a super part of uh, of an athlete's uh, athlete's journey that mm. is so important yeah absolutely was there a you've written a book but was there a a book or a quote that had a positive impact on you as a as an athlete growing up oh well the it's probably the book that's most I hear most recommended on podcasts but it was the one that was recommended to me by this my sports psychologist in that Olympic year which is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning mm. so I read it then and it it made a big impact on me um and I'm, I talk a bit about him in the book as well um so for I mean I've, I've read a lot I mean I I, that was one of the, the ways I kind of extended my identity when I was an athlete was just was by reading widely. So, but but that one definitely stands out as as pretty special, and that kind of points in this direction of in sport we need to understand individually and as a collective what what our meaning is in doing it, and and that there's great power in it. So Viktor Frankl says that the kind of his his version of therapy is is based on that purpose is the central driving force mm. of kind of humans and and so we recognize that as an as an athlete as a coach that you that that purpose is is, is motivational then it can it can really start to affect how you go about life that it's not just about i need to win i need to be selected but what's the purpose of of getting there of, of being of being that athlete yeah I, I agree. Matt, Man's Search for Meaning has been a, a great book for me as well. Like that, I, I wish I'd read these these um, earlier and and as well. And but I probably reckon I wouldn't have been able to digest all the the thinking and and probably got through it as much because I was so so into uh, into my sport and head down and focused on that. So it's really important that again coaches perhaps read these books and embrace that that thinking and 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 show that practice and show that that way of looking at life and, and that teaching the the athletes of their purpose and where their value really lies that's mm. that's where this t starts to transform both individuals and teams and communities and much much broader um lawrence thank you so much for for doing this mate this has been um, an amazing conversation i could have gone on for for ages um where's the best pl place for people to find you to to find the book as well just some unreservedly shameless self-promotion <laughs> here just take it away yeah well probably twitter is the best lawrence house did on twitter um and i think that the book you can find in is actually due for publication on the 20th of august so it's you can pre-order now but it's on waterstones amazon um or through the link on my twitter bio so that, that's the best place to start. Or, but I would definitely recommend people check out the trueathleteproject.org because that's where so all of this has come from and and where we're really putting it into practice as well. So the book is just describing what we're doing in the True Athlete Project. 
Yeah, all the links will be in the show notes for people to uh, to find it. But mate, thank you so much for your time. I and really last thing, it. we are currently opening for recruitment. We're recruiting our next cohort of the mentoring program starting in January next year. So any elite athletes or young aspiring athletes, go to the True Athlete Project and have a look and, apl- and apply. Yep, I can't recommend it enough for sure. And again, like I said, leave all the links in the show notes for people to, to jump onto all of that. Lawrence, thanks again for, for doing this. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, mate. Lovely.